Thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, so as, uh, as you just heard, my background is in anxiety disorders. I've been working in uh, the area of anxiety disorders for about 20 years now. And um, over time, I've kind of found that a lot of people with anxiety also have difficulties with perfectionism and uh, began to develop an interest in perfectionism and did a little bit of research in perfectionism. And at that point was um, uh, approached about writing a book on perfectionism uh, based on this little bit of research I had done, which was clearly not enough uh, to do a book. Um, and uh, when we decided to write the book, it really forced us to really begin to think about perfectionism and what it is, uh, how it can be a problem, and how people can overcome it. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to be um, beginning with a discussion just about the nature of perfectionism, uh, understanding perfectionism. Uh, I'll talk about some strategies for overcoming perfectionism and some emerging research on on these strategies and whether they're effective for helping people to uh, overcome perfectionism. When we wrote our book, uh, there really wasn't any research yet on the treatment of perfectionism, uh, and now there is, just over the last uh, few years. Um, this is a definition of perfectionism from the dictionary, uh, and according to this definition, perfectionism is a disposition to regard anything short of perfection as unacceptable. Um, and you can imagine in some cases that may be a problem. In other cases, that may not be a problem. In fact, that perfectionism may help people to succeed in their lives. Um, Martha Stewart, for example, has described herself in an interview with Oprah as a maniacal uh, perfectionist. Uh, she said if she wasn't, uh, she wouldn't have her company. Oops, sorry. She wouldn't have her company. Uh, and she's proven that being a perfectionist uh, can be profitable and admirable. So she certainly doesn't see perfectionism as a problem. Um, Serena Williams also has been interviewed, um, this was an interview from last year, uh, where she said, I get really angry and I'm a perfectionist. Uh, I have a slight case of OCD. Um, I, have to, I cut out a little bit of the quote where she says she hasn't actually been diagnosed with OCD. This is her sort of self-description. Uh, uh, self um, I think it's good to have it. I mean, uh, you have lots of order in your life. Uh, I like to be really ordered. I like order. Um, so again, Serena Williams describes herself as a perfectionist and sees it as a good thing, something that helps her to succeed in her life. Um, another person who's described himself as a perfectionist is Karen Kane, an uh, internationally known Canadian ballerina. Uh, and for her, the perfectionism was not something she saw as uh, necessarily something that's helpful. Uh, she discussed in her book, um, uh, Movement Never Lies, she discussed uh, in her late 20s, I'm not sure why that keeps happening. Um, where am I? Sorry. Uh, she discussed uh, a period in her late 20s uh, where she suffered from severe depression. Uh, and during that period, she described herself as having become preoccupied with performing well, uh, which only led to her doubting her own abilities and a further loss of confidence. So she described herself as a perfectionist, but really saw it as a problem. Um, my guess is that her perfectionism really helped her in her dancing, um, but probably hurt her in other areas of her life. So perfectionism isn't necessarily a problem, um, but it can be a problem. This is another definition of perfectionism by David Burns, a psychiatrist who's written a number of best-selling books on overcoming depression, anxiety, and other problems. Um, according to Burns, and this, is, this definition is one that he came up with about 30 years ago in an article that's now a sort of a classic article from Psychology Today. Um, according to, uh, sorry, this keeps going on its own. Um, according to David Burns, a perfectionist is someone whose standards are high beyond reach or reason uh, and who strains compulsively and unremittingly toward impossible goals, and who measures their own worth uh, entirely in terms of productivity and accomplishment. Um, so you can imagine, uh, in, in this case, um, perfectionism is a problem. First of all, the person is setting high standards, which is not in itself a problem, but the standards are impossibly high. They're standards that the person can't possibly meet. Uh, second, the person is measuring their entire self-worth in terms of whether they meet these standards that they can't possibly meet. Um, so you can imagine, if, if that's the case, you're going to feel depressed, you're going to feel anxious. Um, the perfectionism is, perfectionism is going to be a problem for you. And this is the perfectionism that uh, I've focused on in my own practice and in my own writings on, uh, on perfectionism. So uh, one of the questions that I encourage my own clients and patients and people that I work with to ask themselves is whether their perfectionism is a problem, first of all, and in what areas is perfectionism a problem? So these are questions that I encourage people to ask themselves. So are my standards um, higher than those of other people? Am I able to meet my standards? Do I get upset if I don't meet my standards or if other people don't meet my standards? Perfectionism can be aimed at oneself or it can be aimed at other people. You can have unreasonably high standards for others. Do my standards help me to achieve my goals or do they get in the way? 
Um, what would be the costs and benefits of changing my standards? If people discover that their standards, first of all, are impossibly high and that they are causing problems for them, those may be standards that they want to change. Uh, there may be other standards, though, that they don't want to change, standards that they're, they're happy with. Um, what we've found over the years uh, through some of our research, but also research in, in labs uh, across the world, is that uh, perfectionism is associated with a number of psychological problems. Um, so we see a lot of perfectionism in people who are very socially anxious or shy. Uh, so you can imagine if you are terrified of making a bad impression on others, uh, you might be very perfectionistic around how you come across uh, in front of other people. You might not be perfectionistic at home, but in social situations you might be. Um, people can be perfectionistic in their relationships. They may want the perfect relationship, or they may expect their partner to be perfect uh, in different ways. Um, people, sorry. Um, people also, um, uh, we also see, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I went to the wrong slide again. So we also see that uh, perfectionism is associated with worry and uh, generalized anxiety. Um, obsessive compulsive problems, um, compulsive hand washing, for example, um, doubts about whether you've done things correctly and having to go back and check. Um, depression is associated with elevated perfectionism. Eating disorders, um, body image problems uh, are associated with elevated perfectionism around appearance, physical appearance uh, and the body and weight. Um, anger can be associated with perfectionism. Uh, if you are very perfectionistic toward others and you hold other people to impossibly high standards, um, you may get very frustrated or angry if people are not uh, able to meet those standards. Um, in terms of the area, life areas that are affected by perfectionism, um, work and school uh, certainly can be, relationships as I mentioned, um, leisure activities, in fact a lot of perfectionists don't bother with leisure activities, uh, they're very focused on work, uh, neatness, cleanliness, uh, uh, aesthetics, having to have things look perfect, um, organization and ordering. Some people will just spend hours and hours uh, making to-do lists that are color, load, uh, color coded and making to-do lists for their family members um, and, and not actually get any of the things done on the to-do lists because they're so busy organizing and making the to-do lists. Um, communication, people may be perfectionistic around uh, their writing or around uh, their speaking. Um, their physical appearance, their hair for example, or their weight or their clothing. Uh, and lastly, their health. People may have very strict rules around diet or exercise. And in small amounts, these kinds of perfectionistic behaviors, again, can be helpful. Uh, but when they're extreme, they can end up causing problems or taking away from other areas of people's lives. So I'd like to talk now about some of the strategies that we've uh, developed and written about for um, changing perfectionism. And again, as I mentioned, when we developed our book, and, and this is when we wrote our book, this is the book here, um, Richard Swinson and I wrote it, um, called When Perfect Isn't Good Enough. The first edition of this book came out in 1998, and at that time there really wasn't any research on how to overcome perfectionism or how to change it. And what we did is we took research and, and uh, treatments that were developed for other kinds of problems that are associated with perfectionism, like depression, like anxiety problems, um, treatments for eating disorders, and we adapted them specifically for perfectionism. And that's basically how we came up with the, uh, the strategies in the book. Uh, and the main strategies we focused on in the book were strategies for changing perfectionistic thinking and strategies for changing per perfectionistic behavior. Uh, in terms of perfectionistic thinking, these are some of the cognitive features of perfectionism. One thing we see a lot in perfectionism is uh, all or nothing thinking. Uh, so a tendency to see things in black or white, uh, black and white, or a tendency to see things as either right or wrong. Um, so for example, a person may have the thought that if I've eaten one cookie, I might as well just eat the whole bag because I've blown my diet. Uh, there's nothing in between. Um, you know, I must always do things a certain way. Um, I, I should do things this way. So a lot of should statements, must statements. Um, psychologist Albert Ellis uh, called that shooting on yourself um, or masturbation. Um, <laughs> The, uh, another type of uh, anxious thinking that we see, or perfectionistic thinking that we see, is unrealistic and inflexible standards. Uh, so again, the standards are impossible to meet, and for most of us, we all occasionally have standards that are impossible to meet, um, but if we can't meet our standards, we'll adjust our standards. Perfectionists have a lot of trouble doing that, uh, so they'll stick to a standard even if it is impossible to meet. Um, overestimating the likelihood of bad things happening. Um, so, and we see this across anxiety problems. People will predict that something bad will happen if, if they don't behave in a certain way. If, they don't, if the towels aren't lined up properly, uh, that people will notice that and they'll think terrible things about me, for example. Um, underestimating one's ability to cope with bad things if they were to happen. So if my towels were not lined up perfectly, that would be a disaster. Or if I were to get a B in my course, that would be a disaster. 
Um, I was working with a student for a, a while ago who was very concerned about getting high grades, and I asked her if she was to find out that she got the second highest grade in the class, uh, would that be good news or bad news? Uh, and she said that would be devastating. Um, so for her, there was nothing, there, basically there was the highest grade in the class or nothing. Uh, we're the, only, the highest grade was the only thing that was acceptable. Um, we see in perfectionism an excessive need for control. Um, people have a lot of difficulty uh, coping with uncertainty. Um, being overly focused on details and, and maybe missing the, the big picture. So being very focused when they're writing perhaps on their handwriting uh, or on spelling and really missing the main message of what it is they're trying to write. Uh, in terms of changing uh, perfectionistic thinking, these are some of the strategies that, uh, that we describe in the book. So one of them is examining the evidence. So rather than assuming that your anxious or perfectionistic belief is true, um, questioning your belief. We all tend to uh, assume our beliefs are true, and that can get us into trouble if our beliefs are not true. So we want people to begin to question their beliefs, to look at the, the evidence um, for their uh, anxiety-provoking beliefs rather than assuming that they're true. Um, behavioral experiments. Uh, these involve basically testing out a belief by doing a little experiment. So for example, if uh, somebody has the belief that if I uh, make a mistake uh, in a letter that I'm writing, it would be absolutely terrible, we might have the pur person purposely make a mistake, maybe put the wrong postal code or, uh, on the letter before they send it off, and see what happens, and just learn to tolerate that, uh, that discomfort. Um, I wouldn't have people put the wrong address on their tax return or something like that. Um, with any of these practices, we typically would do things where the, the actual consequences would be, would be minimal and manageable. Um, perspective shifting. So trying to think from the perspective of someone who's not a perfectionist. Maybe imagining what kind of advice they might have for a friend who was coming to them with a similar kind of perfectionistic thought. A lot of times, people may have very high standards for themselves, but they're much more generous and, and flexible in how they think for other people. Um, sometimes not, um, but, but often that can be the case. Learning to compromise. Uh, so for example, people may have the belief that there's only one way to wash the dishes, and they may be married to someone who has the belief that there's also only one way to wash the dishes, and it's a different way than that other person uh, thinks that the dishes should be washed. So trying to find a, a, a place to compromise, especially for issues that are not especially important. Um, learning to tolerate uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. So asking the question, um, you know, would it, would it matter uh, if, if I don't know what the outcome is? The fact that the, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, does that mean that the outcome is going to be negative, for example? So again, having people question the belief that they may hold that I must know uh, what the outcome is at all, at all times. Um, so for example, if someone has the thought, uh, my haircut looks terrible and I need to avoid being seen in public, um, we might encourage them to, to question that belief, uh, to look at other ways of, of thinking about the situation. And through that process, um, hopefully come to the realization that uh, other people are probably much less interested in, in my haircut than I am uh, and may not even notice. Um, has anybody here ever had a bad haircut? Um, yeah, so it's something that everybody experiences. Uh, another example of a sort of perfectionistic thought, it would be a disaster if the dessert I made didn't turn out perfectly. Um, here I might have people ask them the question, ask themselves the question, have they been to a party where the dessert or some dish didn't turn out perfectly and was it a disaster um, when it was at somebody else's house? Um, and, and often people will recognize when it's not them that it's not the end of the world. Um, so, uh, and then again, we can also do a behavioral experiment where the person uh, maybe purposely serves a dessert that isn't perfect and, and sees what happens. And again, the goal would be to shift that thinking to a more realistic thought. Uh, my family will probably still enjoy the dessert, and even if they don't, uh, it won't be the end of the world. Um, in terms of behaviors, uh, these are some behavioral features, uh, behavioral features of perfectionism. So overcompensating, overpreparing, memorizing presentations, rehearsing them over and over and over and over again, much more than, than you need to. Um, excessive checking, um, excessive uh, reassurance seeking as well can be features of perfectionism. Um, trying to change the behavior of others uh, if, if the person's perfectionism is, perfectionism is very other-oriented. Um, excessive organizing and list making, as I mentioned earlier. Not knowing when to quit. You know, sometimes it's best to just give up if you're working on something that you're just not going to be able to, uh, to get done. Um, perfectionists may have trouble um, knowing when to quit. They may also have the opposite problem where they quit too soon uh, and they give up before they need to. Um, procrastinating. Uh, failure to delegate. Perfectionists often believe that nobody else can possibly do things as well as them, so they end up doing everything themselves. 
Um, and to change perfectionistic behavior, uh, some of the strategies we use, um, behavioral strategies, include these. Uh, exposure to feared situations. Again, purposely serving a, a dessert that isn't perfect, or purposely leaving the house a little bit messy, for example. Purposely mispronouncing a word, or losing your, um, uh, your, your train of thought during a presentation, um, <laughs> for example. So, um, and what we find with any kind of fear is that if people do the thing that they're afraid of, um, their fear comes down. If they're afraid of dogs and they practice being around dogs, they become less afraid. And it's the same with perfectionism. If you practice doing things imperfectly, uh, you become more comfortable with imperfection. Um, preventing safety behaviors, the little things that people do to protect themselves in situations. Um, so, for example, the perfectionist might ask for a lot of reassurance from people that they're doing a good job. We might encourage the person not to do that, to learn that even if they don't have that reassurance, it's not the end of the world. Setting priorities. Perfectionists sometimes get involved in way too many things and can't possibly get everything done, and learning to prioritize can be useful. Um, and then lastly, uh, preventing uh, procrastination, learning to break uh, overwhelming tasks down into smaller tasks so that they're more manageable. Uh, in terms of research on perfectionism, really it's just over the last couple of years that studies have begun to emerge on the treatment of perfectionism. And basically there's been one study uh, out of England uh, looking at the treatment of perfectionism and a couple of studies out of Australia. And I'm going to talk about the studies of, uh, in Australia because they use the treatment that I've been discussing today. So they use my book um, as a, a treatment for perfectionism. So in this particular study, one that I'll mention um, today, they had 49 people who received... Um, uh, a copy of uh, When Perfect Isn't Good Enough, and they either had the self-help book alone and had to just work through it on their own, or they worked through the treatment with a therapist. So they had the self-help treatment uh, and a therapist. So they called the, the version with the therapist guided self-help, and the version where people just got the book uh, pure self-help. And just briefly, the, um, what they found in the study is that both groups uh, benefited from the treatment. So they did find a, a reduction in perfectionism as a result of uh, going through this treatment. Um, they also found that improvement was better in the group that had the guided self-help, that had the therapist along with the book. Um, and that's not so surprising. Uh, you know, if you think about um, a book on uh, physical fitness, for example, you can pick up a book on physical fitness. It's not going to get you physically fit, though. Um, unless you really do everything that's in the book. And sometimes having a personal trainer uh, to work through the, uh, the strategies with you um, makes it more likely that you're going to get the things done. You're a little more accountable um, to complete the exercises and, and you end up benefiting more. So, um, but both groups ended up benefiting from the treatment. Um, just a couple of conclusions before I stop today, uh, just things I want to remind you of and a couple of other points that I want to make, uh, is that extreme perfectionism, as, as with any uh, personality trait at extreme levels, um, can lead to problems for people in their work and in their relationships and other areas of their life. Um, also, um, there are effective strategies for reducing perfectionism uh, and both the, the kind of thoughts that go along with perfectionism and the behaviors that go along with perfectionism. Um, many people, though, are ambivalent about getting treatment for their perfectionism. They may worry, for example, that if they learn to be less perfect, uh, everything will be chaotic and they'll, they'll lose something uh, that they don't want to lose. Um, so people may be ambivalent about that. And the other challenge we have is that a lot of therapists are just not trained to treat perfectionism. So that even if somebody uh, does go for treatment, uh, it's often challenging to find that treatment. And, and my hope certainly is that uh, over time, uh, these treatments will be disseminated more widely. People will be more aware of them uh, and, and willing to seek help. And therapists who offer these kinds of treatments will be more familiar, familiar with how to treat uh, perfectionism. So I'll stop there. So thank you very much.